So yes, this is a preview of ICEA, the International Cost Estimation and Analysis Association software cost estimation body of knowledge. And this is really a pilot program that we've been working on. And for years and years and years, I had collected software cost estimation books and really didn't know why. And I've collected them from people like Dick Studsky and Dr. Barry Beam and Dan Galreth and I and Capers Jones. And I had two boxes of these hardcover books and as the universe kind of anybody who follows um you know manifestation or anything will will realize that when you wish for something oftentimes you get it and when this contract came up to work with icea to actually be the lead author to pull together disparate information from all over the world to create a software cost estimation body of knowledge I knew I was in the right place. It was like my dream come true contract. So I'm really excited about this and I'm really excited to share it with all of you. And I know we've got people from all over the world. I know that it is about 2.30 or 3 a.m. in Malaysia with some of my clients there and I'd like to welcome them. And we've got people from Seattle, from QSM, we've got people from Galarith, we've got people from as as Pierre said, from around the world. So it, it's exciting to be able to share this with you and present it as a pilot, which gives you as software cost engineers and measurement engineers the chance to participate and really make this something that is of value. So as Pierre introduced me, which was a very kind introduction, I'm the lead author. I'm an IFPUG past president. I've been involved in IFPUG and ISO standards since about 1992. I've been an ISO project editor. I've one of the co-authors of one of the books that IceBags actually produced called Practical Project Estimation, um, Software Measurement Compendium, um, and other ones. And I've always run a company called Quality Plus Technologies. So I'm a consultant, an author, a speaker, and an instructor. And the picture on the far left here is actually one I took because I live in Florida and being based in Florida gives me the incredible opportunity to have good weather year round. And that's something that's always been important to me. So in terms of the ICEA cost estimation body of knowledge, I'm gonna go through and do a lesson outline. We're gonna take a look at the eight different or the 10 different lessons that we've actually pulled together and this was based on a, an established curriculum on software cost estimation in the United States from the Defense Acquisition University, which is an incredible organization, but was very US centric, very Department of Defense centric. And so what we did was we took this and we de-defensized it. We took all the valuable, really good pieces and combined it with expertise from around the world. So I'm gonna walk through and tell you a little bit about what our lessons are and what they include. Lesson zero is an introduction to our overall curriculum. Lesson one, we're gonna take a look at the importance and motivation for the software cost estimation body of knowledge. Now realize that cost estimation involves in a lot of cases, huge programs, multi-million dollar, tens of millions of dollars in, in cost estimates. And some of it includes software. While software cost estimation is very different from hardware cost estimation and is very different from construction estimation. So we wanted to place the software CBOC in a position where we can actually take a look at the importance and motivation, especially for people who are not traditionally software cost, esti cost estimating engineers. Lesson two takes a look at the different types of software development paradigms. We take a look at predictive versus adaptive. Lesson three, we've developed a software SPIBOC five-step estimating process that I'll walk you through. Lesson four actually is where the rubber really hits the road, where we actually have case studies on how to apply the different methods and methodologies and take a look at actually coming up with software cost estimates. Lesson five takes a look at something called software sustainment. That is the post full operational capability, um, maintenance, and full operational um, 
sustainment of that piece of software. Lesson six, we're taking a look at estimating procured software solutions, things like enterprise resource planning, things like data warehouses. How do you fit commercial off the shelf software in with your cost estimation? And then we've got three additional um, lessons, which really are concept lessons, where we explore lesson X is a software sizing, where we've got all different types of software size. Lesson Y takes a look and explores productivity. And lesson Z, which is really important, are those commercial estimating models, commercial software that supports all of these different methods. The ICS um, software cost estimation body of knowledge um, pilot, I didn't do it myself. I'd love to say I'm the world's expert on cost estimation, but I had some really great, wonderful teamwork. Um, I had Kevin Sincotta, who is the ICA certification chair and also works for MITRE in the United States. Rick Collins, who was the ICA president last year and works for Technomics. Bob Hunt, who's on our, who's going to be presenting next, who is now the ICA president this year and next year. Uh, Dave Brown from Technomics, Dr. Wilson Rosa, who's with the US Department of Homeland Security Cost Analysis Division. Dr. Christian Smart, who presented this morning, who was part of the ICEA board and he's part of Galareth. Megan Jones, who is our ICEA executive director. And then, I, and then we were supported by two of the NESMA contacts, Eric von Vliet, van der Vliet, um, who's with CGI and NESMA, and Harold von Heeringen, NESMA and Metri. And I had a huge review group, which consists of people like Dr. Arlene Mikovic, who provided some just incredible insights. Um, Denise, Denise Wilson from, or, oh, I just, Denise from um, Boeing. And I had a number of other really great resources that helped me out. So it was really a team effort and it was tons and tons of work. So in terms of a global audience, the, the goal behind this was to really create a global software cost estimation body of knowledge, not one that's US centric, not one that's European or Australian centric, but something that would appeal to the international audience. So CBO, software CBOC audiences consist of cost estimators and or software engineers from various industries. So we didn't want it just to be defense or large government. So it includes original equipment manufacturers, OEMs, prime contractors, subcontractors from government and defense and intelligence and civil agency type projects throughout the world, um, government organizations, IT departments, so banks, insurance companies, consulting firms, commercial or government, government and quasi-government organizations, academic institutions. Really, this is appealing to any group that needs to perform a software cost estimate. And one of the things that may surprise you, which kind of surprised me, is that software cost estimating, an estimate could take months to prepare. That kind of surprised me. I thought, well, how hard could this be? Well, when you're truly doing a great job, and you really want to perform a reliable and realistic cost estimate, you need to take all sorts of things into consideration. And things like the cost estimating relationships and the schedule estimating relationships, those CERs and SERs that Kim and Sarah and Christian were talking about this morning are absolutely critical importance. So it can absolutely take months to prepare a good solid cost estimate. So the software CBOC does provide the user whose background and expertise are intended to be based in cost estimating and analysis with an understanding of software estimating to complement and enhance their regular cost estimate and analysis. Software CBOC does not endorse any particular method of software sizing as being superior or inferior to one or another. Now I know having grown up in Canada, we were very prescriptive. I can remember doing consulting where somebody would ask me, what is the number one? What is your best guess or your best analysis of what we should use? In the Canadian, in the Canadian society, absolutely, that was something that would work. In the United States and many other countries, that doesn't work. And so we want to give the consumer, we want to give the clients the ability to choose 
by presenting here's advantages and disadvantages, but it's really up to you, the consumer, to choose what method's going to work and how you can tailor it to meet your particular needs because it's not a one size fits all. We're not endorsing any particular software development methodology. We're not saying use waterfall, use agile. We're saying, here's what you do. Here's the best way of preparing a software cost estimate. If you're in an agile paradigm, if you're in a waterfall paradigm, if you're doing procurement, and it does not prescribe the essential considerations in software cost estimation. However, we do provide you with best practice guidance. So this comes from our um, terms of reference in May 2020. The software CBOC builds on ICEA's cost estimation body of knowledge, and there was some absolutely phenomenal information that's already out there. So the, the CBOC or CEBOK, the cost estimating body of knowledge, we're assuming that you have the basic knowledge of cost estimating content as highlighted already here. This is available to ICEA members at this wiki, and the contents that are listed here, we are assuming that you will have a basis in this information. We do not repeat how to do regression analysis. We do not repeat how to do probability and basic statistics. You're expected to be able to go into the CBOC and add on to it. So this does not replace the CBOC. This is a add-on extension to the main ICA product. So why do we do this? Why, why was it even established in the first place? Well, software presents a number of unique challenges for an estimator to get a realistic or close enough estimate. Understanding software cost estimation is absolutely critical because software is increasingly part of every program estimate. Even if software is a minor portion, a software cost estimate can cripple or can make success out of a program estimate. Paradigms, software growth, package solutions, cost drivers, and the correct usage of historical data are absolutely prerequisites to realistic estimates. And the status quo of what we're doing right now, guessing, assuming, well, you'll see in a few slides, where that's led us to. And it's just not good enough today. We need a formal estimating process with historical data and repeatable practices in order to make this work. So here's a bonus that uh, this is kind of a, an advertisement for ICEA, but it, it's, it is an absolute incredible value. For $400 US dollars, you can have access to all of the software CBOC pilot sessions that were recorded and all of the cost estimation body of knowledge lessons for six months at this, um, at this link. And I'll put this in the chat afterwards. But for 400 US dollars, you get all the training, you get all the content for the pilot software CBOC, you get all of the regular cost estimation body of knowledge. And we've got incredible people who were part of the recordings. Bob Hunt did lesson one. Um, Dr. Christian Smart did lesson four. So we've got some just incredible talent. Um, Dr. Arlene Minkovich and Karen McRitchie did lesson um, Z on the commercial estimating or commercial estimating models. So we've got some incredible talent that helped us out and really provided some excellent value in training. So let's go through the lessons and, and I'd like to just give you kind of the highlights on what we put into each of these lessons. So in lesson one, the importance and motivation for software cost estimation. Here's the lesson outline. Why is it important? Why should we care about software cost and schedule estimation? Now a software cost estimate or a software estimate actually consists of typically four completely separate pieces. We've got the software size estimate, if we've got a basis for size, which can then lead us into a software cost estimate because the size of your software development is kind of a proxy for our software labor estimate. And the labor hours we can turn into a cost estimate because the, the major portion of a software um, development cost is in the labor to produce that software. 
from a software development effort, we can create the cost, we can also create a schedule out of that. So really, we've got four different pieces that are part of what we consider to be a software estimate. We look at the impact of software estimation on project outcomes and setting the stage for the remainder of the software CBUC lessons, developing an understanding of what are and how to create credible and defensible software estimates, defining a common terminology that is useful to a software cost estimator, and in introducing something called the software life cycle, not the software development life cycle, but the software life cycle in the fit with software development and acquisition decision making, whether it's contracted out or it's internal to your own department. Lesson two, start taking a look at terminology and the definitions of what constitutes software development? What do we mean by software development? An introduction to the paradigms, the comparison and contrast of the paradigms that are in use today. And what are the cost considerations of those different paradigms? How do we cost things in Agile differently from how we cost them in Waterfall? So when we take a look at the adaptive versus predictive um, paradigms, this is just kind of one of the slides that gives you an overview. And the differentiator between agile and predictive methods are things like the focus of work. The focus of work for agile methods is change driven based on product value. We've got a fixed time and cost and the scope evolves as compared to predictive methods where you're, you start out with a fixed scope and you estimate the cost and duration. The frequency of deployment is obviously different, where we've got iterative, frequent, and early two to three week sprints that are involved versus one big release at the end of the project. So for all of you here on the International Software Cost or, um, International Software Benchmarking Standards Group, you already know about software, but cost estimators throughout the world who have done facilities and hardware and other things, they really need to be able to know what do we mean by paradigms? What do we mean by software development? We've got customer involvement, the risk of changing requirements, development teams, operations and security considerations, and the prototypical contract type. Do we have time and materials or cost reimbursable versus firm fixed price? And we go into all of these types of things and the nuances behind them. We take a look at the differences in fixed versus um, estimated costs and scope and drivers and development risks. When we get into lesson three, we take a look at the five step estimating process. And this came from a number of best practices in the United States and throughout the world. So we synthesized and distilled 14 step and seven step and 12 step processes into five major steps. So our lesson outline, we take a look at the different types of estimates. Are we doing a software life cycle cost estimate? Are we doing a bid response estimate? What kind of estimate are we actually doing for custom software development? Now our five step process that we go through is number one, develop the scope of the estimate. What is the scope and purpose for even doing a software cost estimate in the first place? The next thing we do is we collect and analyze historical data. And this, this area, I have to tell you, is really great news for ice bags because historical data is the foundation for doing a solid cost estimate. So I've really emphasized that ice bags for our development and enhancement database and for the maintenance and support when we get into sustainment, those are critical. Within the United States Department of Defense, there is a great database, but if you don't have access to that, what can you use? Well, we've recommended that ice bags absolutely supplement that. So we create the software estimate, we adjust the estimate for risk and uncertainty, which is absolutely critical. There's way too many estimates that are put out there that simply do not take a look at that. And that's why we end up being underestimating. We want to document and present the estimate and present it within the context that it should be developed and presented. Lesson four takes a look at estimating custom, custom software development. So using our five-step process, that we present in lesson three, we actually take a look at a high level overview. We review software size and productivity lessons. We take a look at our five-step estimating process 
And then we look at three different ways of creating a software estimate using estimating techniques. We look at those estimating techniques. We create an estimate using two different case studies. We take a look at the schedule estimate. We time phase it. We cross check it. And then outside of that, we take a look at how do you review an estimate that would be prepared by other people? So what are, the, what are the salient points that we need to take a look at? How do you make sure that the um, estimate has a sound basis, that it's defensible? How do you know that the size is appropriate? What are the questions you need to ask? So we take a look at three ways to develop or create a software development estimate. The first way is to take a look at the size. So we start off with estimating the size and estimate the effort based on size and implying that we've got productivity. We can estimate the schedule and cost then based on that effort. And what are the associated approaches? Well, we've got parametric, where we actually derive a cost estimating relationship. So we analyze the data. We do the regression that Sarah and um, Kim and Christian were talking about with the machine with their machine learning um, presentation. We also take a look at using published CERs. You may not have the data. You may not have good historical data. So you may want to use a parametric approach, such as a commercial estimating model or Kokomo 2 as, as options. And the prerequisites for that would be having historical data having some sort of idea of the software size available and some known criteria. We also take a look at estimating size and productivity using an analogy or productivity type based approach. And the analogy approach, of course, we, we involve the CAVE database if you've got um, access to it and ice bags. So that would mean we've got a software size available, some known criteria. The third method is and, and this is actually prevalent. I was kind of surprised at this. I was thinking that everyone has data available, but there are some, a lot of commercial enterprises that have no data. And so what do they use? Well, they'll use a wideband Delphi or expert opinion. And we go through and we, we take a look at how do you actually do that with some level of formality. And that's really important. And then we also take a look at commercial enterprise or commercial estimating models, such as SIRSAM, such as QSM SLIM, such as um, Prices Tool. And all of these things, we take a look at, we cross check them, we look at estimating models, rules of thumb, whatever we can use to present a solid, reliable, and credible software cost estimate. Software sustainment, we get into it when, we, when we've got the software that's been delivered. We're taking a look at definitions and terminology. Now, if I said to you, we're going to collect data on software maintenance, you might say, oh my gosh, well, Capers Jones has come up with approximately 25 to 30 different categories of, of types of tasks that are included in software, software maintenance. We don't want to be all over the map. We want to be very precise with our definitions and terminology, especially when we're comparing it to established data or historical data. So we take a look at the differences between software sustainment and the definitions of what constitutes sustainment versus software maintenance. We define those. We have a software sustainment cost element structure that we use. And we take a look at something called software changes, which are small enhancement, software maintenance, and cybersecurity. We look at the importance of software sustainment because software sustainment involves much, much more in some, some organizations. If you're in a governmental organization that has a large program, that will include help desks that are dedicated to those programs. We need to include that type of thing. Things like facilities, things like software licenses. So we really need to make sure that we are comparing apples to apples, not apples to oranges, and coming up with the best data foundation type estimates. So we take a look at the importance of software sustainment, data normalization, drawing the line, where does development end and sustainment begin? And that's where that DevSecOps comes into play. What, is the, what are the activities we're actually estimating and trying to provide an estimate for? The reasons for the high costs of software sustainment. Pay me now or pay me later. 
If we don't have a quality process in the first place, it's going to increase your software sustainment costs. So we take a look at cost estimating techniques. We take a look at the software sustainment risk and uncertainty considerations. We look at the implications of DeskSecOps on structure and how does it affect time phasing of our estimates. We have a quick note about the obsolescence of software, especially when we're taking a look at packaged software that becomes obsolete. And then we've got quick references and rules of thumbs, and again, a lesson summary. When we're taking a look at sustainment, sustainment overall, meaning SWS, this is our cost element structure, and the software changes maintenance exists within this one small circle. And this is based on some leading data, the leading data and analysis that's being done by Cheryl Jones within the US, um, US and that is presented at ICEA on an annual basis. We've got different methods that we take a look at. We can, we can estimate overall software sustainment, or we can estimate software maintenance, or we can estimate software changes. So we, we're very precise, and that's part of what's going to lead us into a good certification program. Then we get into procured software solutions. So we draw, draw the lines between investment and sustainment. We take a look at what really is caught software, commercial off the shelf. We identify the different types of solutions. And we've got a lot of hybrids. A lot of times we end up with hybrid solutions. So we've got different cost estimating approaches for COTS purchases versus software as a service versus service oriented architectures versus ERP, enterprise resource planning, versus enterprise data warehouses and data marts and operational data stores and hybrids. And what do we, what happens about cost growth and procured software solutions? So we take a look at all of these different things. We've got a flow chart that we go through that we figure out, okay, how are we going to decide what model, what, what should we actually be using as we're going through? So we've got all of these defined. So depending on whether we're doing custom software, we'd use custom software development, we go into lesson four. Now lesson six, which is our procured software solutions, these are different ways of taking a look at it. We can have cost drivers that are vendor quotes or the number of interfaces, the amount of glue code we need. Rice FW objects, reports, interfaces, conversions, extensions or enhancements, forms and workflows. How do we bring that into play? We've got all of that. Executive information systems. What do you do about a enterprise data warehouse? Those extract, transform and loads, the number of migrated tables, that type of thing. And then we take a look at, well, what do you do if there's a hybrid? What if you're preparing and developing hybrid solutions? So that's primarily, those are all of our main core subject areas. And then we take a look, and because size is so important, within our original curriculum, size was just embedded, but size is critical. So we take a look at software size as a cost driver for software development. We take a look at physical size, source lines of code, or effective source lines of code, or equivalent to new source lines of code. We take a look at the functional size and the extensions to functional size for non-functional software requirements. We take a look at the value adjustment factor. We take a look at object points. We take a look at use case points and the extensions that use case points can provide us. We take a look at the relative effort measures for agile software development, the story points. What does story points mean? How can those be used? We take a look at Rice FW objects for enterprise resource planning solutions. We take a look at all of those. How do you choose a good sizing approach? What are the conversions? What kind of rules of thumb do we have? And what kind of questions should you be asking if you're given a size estimate on which to base your cost estimate? We also take a look at some commercial software estimating or commercial sizing tools. The um, slot counters from the University of Southern California. We take a look at two types of function point estimating tools. Log apps cadence and then scope master. So we've got examples of all of those, and we have a case study that expands on the basis that I did in the 2008 book, the IT measurement compendium, where we actually expand that to include rules of thumb 
high level cost estimating um, solutions and approaches for cosmic um, high level, for NESMA high level, for IFPUG high level. We've got different approaches and we run all of those, including use cases and use case points through a case study so that you can see the differences. So again, when we're looking at dimensions and units of measure, we've got everything here. And we don't say use COSMIC or use IFPUG or use NESMA. We are presenting it from an objective point of view. Here are all of the different ways that we can use software size. So we've got IFPUG, NESMA, COSMIC, simple function points, object points, use case points, number of requirements. We've got non-functional ex extensions. We take a look at three methods of coming up with story points. We also take a look at the RICE FW for procured software solutions. So it's pretty robust. This, this was a, um, about a year and a half project. When we get into productivity, the lesson outline is we take a look at productivity as a concept and we define productivity in the context of software development cost estimating. We take a look at the S curve. We take a look at the fact that productivity is not a linear construct. We look at different ways of measuring productivity. So specifying your measurement unless it's otherwise specified. Productivity is an input versus an output and how to cross check that and the relationship between size and productivity and how to use those linear constructs for doing good analysis and good analogy estimates. When we're taking a look at productivity, we take a look at are we doing a design code test and implementation or are we actually doing a full scale software development end to end, which includes requirements all the way through to qualification testing, or are we looking at system development? system develop meaning that we actually go through a stakeholder requirements and we would have hardware and software requirements so what are you actually estimating that's going to determine and influence how we measure our productivity and what we consider as productivity we take a look at different types of definitions different types of constructs we've got um, a lot of additional information that is provided here then we get into our final lesson, which is our commercial estimating models. And just because it's at the end doesn't make it less important. It's absolutely critical. We take a look at four major models, the Kokomo 2 web tool. We take a look at Galarith Incorporated, SIRSIM, Price Systems True Planning for Software, and QSM Slim Estimate. There are other methods on the market, but these are the major ones that we've taken a look at. And we've got input for our, for our case studies from all of these different methods from all of these different approaches so we take a look at and use them for comparisons use them as estimating methods um, i talked to somebody when i was developing um, some of the early materials and i i called a friend of mine and i said okay if i took away your software tools how would you go about doing software estimation and he said you can't take my tools away there's no way i need my tools so what we're teaching you in the software cost estimating body of knowledge is how to do your times tables before you take a calculator so that you can see the true value and the meaning behind some of these software cost estimating commercial estimating models. So we're really using data to create realistic estimates and better results. So cost estimation best practices can be tailored to software. So we've got an estimating maturity model that has formal methods involved in it. We're looking at the cone of uncertainty. We really base our estimates on a foundation of solid historical data. We take a look at data analysis and normalization. And normalization to me is one of the critical aspects that a lot of um, software measurement experts don't even necessarily consider. Planning for cost and schedule growth, the cross checks, the sensitivity analysis, the risk and uncertainty, the things that are really important to make software cost estimating a professional endeavor. Capers Jones stated in 2018, the software industry has the worst metrics and measurement practices of any industry in human history. That's pretty daunting. 
that's pretty damning. Well, I kind of counter that. And I did work a lot with Capers Jones. He provided a lot of information, a lot of help and provided books and resources. And I, I would counter what he says by saying the software CBOC will help create realistic data-based estimates. Over time, this is going to lead to more successful projects and hopefully better estimates and better metrics. So I think that working through ice bags, working with ice bag, working with ICEA, we will develop much better software cost estimates going forward. So here's kind of your challenge. How can you, as an industry professional, support the software CBOC? Well, join ICEA. I see it has individual memberships and promote it. And I would encourage you again, this is the, the, um, the link that I had provided before. Register for the 2021 Training Summit recordings. The live presentations were done several weeks ago, but if you, re if you register today, you get six months of access to all of the recordings. So, and it, it's, as I said, I think it's $400 US dollars. It's a little bit cheaper if you're a, depending on what um, organization you're part of, there's group discounts and things. But for $400, you've essentially got an entire curriculum and it's kind of like a buy one, get one. Usually you only get the cost estimation body of knowledge information. This time you get as a bonus, all of the information that we have in the software cost estimation pilot. You can volunteer, you can write certification questions, you can review our materials, we're looking for feedback. And I put my name up here. Um, you can also contact Kevin Sincotta, who is the certification chair, Megan Jones, who is the ICEA um, executive director, or anyone on the ICEA board of directors, including um, Bob Hunt, who's with us today, and Dr. Arlene Minkovich, and any one of a number of other people. So I'm at the end of my presentation. There are additional slides in my, in my slide deck that I just didn't have time to go over. Um, the chaos report by the Standish Group comes out every year and says, you know what? We are failures. We only deliver one in three projects, software, software development projects that are successful. And they define success as being on time and on budget. Well, guess what? If you get much more realistic estimates, if we do data-based estimates, then we can deliver on time and on budget. But if you produce estimates that are way unrealistic, that are way low, you know what happens? Our contracts are created with unrealistically low estimates. And if I said to you, I'll give you $100 to build a hospital, You'd look at me and say, Carol, that'll never work. Well, if I say to you, I'll give you $100 to do this software project, and you can come back and say, no, Carol, based on all the data, it's going to cost us at least $10,000. I can say, okay, based on the data, I believe you. It improves software cost estimation and takes it to a professional level. And I'd encourage you to check out ICA's CBOC, software CBOC and encourage you to be part of this. It's a great new opportunity for anybody in ice bags and anybody who's into software cost estimation. So I'm at the end of my part of the presentation. And I guess I can stop sharing then. Is that right? Uh, you can keep it a little bit. Uh, thanks a lot, Carol. It was really, really interesting. and. Uh, this is why I started in this area because I wanted facts when I was doing estimation of projects. And it was a really impressive uh, work that you have done. And, Thank uh, you. Let's, let's see what we have questions here. You had one from uh, Bonnie first. Uh, she was asking about uh, this uh, offer. How many hours of training materials is within this Oh my gosh, it, <laughs> it, there are, well, for the software CBOC, we have, I think it is 10 hours of training that you actually get. Um, 
I did the one on software size and I did the one on software sustainment. Um, Kristen, as I mentioned, I think he did the one on um, either did lesson three or four. Bob Hunt did lesson one. Dr. Arlene Mikovich and Karen McRitchie did um, lesson six or lesson Z. So we've got, there's about 10 to 12 hours of intensive training and you get all of the materials. That's, that's the other thing. You get a PDF copy of the materials and we'd encourage you that if you, if you listen to the materials and you've got changes or anything like that, we want your feedback because this is an evolving, um, growing process. Um, you also get the 10 to 12 hours that match this of the cost estimation body of knowledge training and that training will prepare you to take the cost estimation body of knowledge exam to be able to get those certifications so the software cost estimation certification is not yet there but you really get a two for it's like two for one at one cost and again you know it's you can look at these for the next six months and I, I can't even think of a better cost estimation value in terms of training. Thanks. And by the way, I'm looking forward when you're coming with a certificate, certification as well. That will be great. And then we have a next question from Thomas Fellman here. Um, what exactly is the role of historical data when developing cyber physical products that not only have software development and OPS? but also compliance cost, cost of uh, sort of certifying for safety and other qualities such as privacy, prevention against hacks. Is that also part of the ski book? Uh, you know what, I, I would love to say this was a one size fits all, but <laughs> Thomas, um, what we've done is we've said, okay, these portions we have included within the soccer CBOC. The other portions, things like privacy and those types of considerations, you're gonna to have to find data sources on which to compare them. And so we, we positioned the software CBOC to say it will estimate your software development costs, your software procurement costs, but it's not a one size fits all. If you've got a software CBOC estimate, you have to add on to that. You have to add things like facilities or help desk. And if you've got cybersecurity type things, you have to add those in. System integration, training, all of those pieces. What we've done is we've said, okay, here's where the software CBOC fits, but you've got to add those other pieces into it. So down the road, yeah, it's going to expand and we'll be including more things. But right now, this is this is our pilot of what we've got. And it's about, see, the original curriculum was about 400 PowerPoint slides. And when I delivered this to Bob Hunt and the team two weeks ago, we are in at about 800 um, PowerPoint slides, plus the case studies, plus, plus, plus. So it's, it's pretty robust, but it is not everything to everybody. Okay, um, then I think we only have a, Paula put up the link to this uh, summit 2021, so. Thank you, Paula. Uh, we don't have any more questions. We only have a lot of thanks for this presentation. And um, uh, I also want to thank you because it was very interesting. So. Well, I'm, I'm uh, excited about it. I, I hope that, I hope that everybody else is excited to to see this and, and start participating because this is where ice bags can really take off. Yeah. And uh, let's help uh, uh, come away with, with this, uh, uh, what uh, said about this area that we are very bad at uh, doing estimates. We have to sharpen up and be better. And this is one way of improving this. Thanks a lot. Thanks so for now, having me.